it's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. This podcast contains explicit language, but it's probably not my fault. Don't worry, I'll talk to the other hosts. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, Slate's national editor, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of January 17th, 2023. On this week's show, we'll talk about the Cowboys' blowout win over Tom Brady and the Bucks, and the other winners and losers from the opening weekend of the NFL playoffs. We'll also discuss why everyone in the NBA is scoring so many points. And finally, we'll have an interview with the Black Widow, Jeanette Lee, the pool legend and subject of the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, Jeanette Lee Versus. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. Stefan Fatsis is off this week, but with me from California is Joel Anderson. He's the host of Slow Burn Season 3 and 6. Hello, Joel. Hello, Josh. And coming to us live from Harlem, our friend, the four-star hater, uh, (laughs) Bomani Jones. (laughs) Bomani Jones of the Right Time Podcast at ESPN and the host and star of HBO's Game Theory, which launches its second season on Friday night. Bomani, what's good? Oh, I'm a hater now just because TCU lost 65 to 7. No, you, no, you're not, you're not a hater. You're not, no, you're a hater for more than that. Uh, you're a hater for more reasons than that. It ain't just the TCU lost, okay? <laughs> I had a question for you. How long, uh, Bamani, just if it's 65 to 7, how long is that going to last for? How, Ever. You know, in, in terms of Ever. your Ever. conversation. Ever. 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 For <laughs> Ever. Ever. That doesn't shake. If it had been fifty-eight to seven, would it have been like a day, a forever minus a day? Like, how does that math work? I, I just, I'm, I just, I'm trying to think of when I won't have that in my back. I don't. You, know, you all can't phase me with that because look, I mean, we were there. Uh, nobody else was, and you know what? We lost, but we. I thought, you know, look, we played our worst game of the season. Georgia played its best. Sometimes shit happens. You want to talk about 1991, the Cotton Bowl, Bomani? 40, 40, 40, 40, 46. Route three. 66. Do we want to talk about Route 60, Route 66? 60, 66, 66 to 3? 66 to 3, yeah. That was pretty mm-hmm. bad. Pretty You're bad. Absolutely it was bad. correct. Mm-hmm. But I would have to say that it was, was Ricky probably, Williams, too, but, by but, the way. But, How do you lose 66 3 Ricky Williams? But what was probably the best part is that not all of America was watching. <laughs> well, if you look at the ratings, uh, not all of America was watching that game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but j- just enough to where there's a whole lot of people that are only know TCU from 65 to 7. Like, this is the kind of thing that programs historically have difficulty recovering from just like being fully aware of what the fuck you are right there in front of everybody <laughs> so yep that- joel's the, joel's not mad he's laughing he actually thinks it's funny yeah that's right exactly yes I- yes, <laughs> yes 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 josh did you notice how joel did that thing where to stave off people talking smack to him he posted baby pictures during the game <laughs> you see that you know uh joel's a great dad 
It, look, man. I mean, look. It, I was gonna do that win or lose. I think it was it was it was a nice passage of time. Yeah. I mean, why 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 not throw your child in front of bullets? You know what I mean? Like why <laughs> why like why wouldn't you do that? This man calling me Nino Brown. Forget it, man. Let's go. <laughs> in our Slate Plus segment, we'll have more with uh, Bamani. Uh, Joel, we'll get to ask him some questions. Maybe try to turn the tables. Maybe not. Uh, to hear that segment, you need to be a Slate Plus member. You get bonus segments on this and other Slate shows, ad-free shows. You get to support us, which is a nice thing to do. Slate.com slash hangup plus. That's slate.com slash hangup plus. It was sort of pitiful, wasn't it? Watching 45-year-old Tom Brady down to his final drive of the season in a 31-14 loss to the Dallas Cowboys. Brady was finally out of comebacks, finally out of the magic that it made him as sure a thing in the NFL playoffs as anyone who ever played the game. After he threw incomplete on 4th and 6 from the Dallas 35, the Cowboys kneeled out the clock and ended the game, their first road playoff win in 30 years. Brady stopped to chat with a few players gathered at midfield before he jogged off and away into the locker room. He tipped his cap to the crowd, the sort of gesture that only feeds into the rampant speculation about his future. And in the post-game press conference, here's what Brady said to the media. We're, we're very grateful for everyone's support. And, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, I love this organization. It's a great place to be. And thank you, everybody, for welcoming me, all you regulars. And um, just very grateful for the respect. And I and, uh, hope I gave the same thing back to you guys. So thank you very much. Tough year for Brady. What was trending last night was Giselle uh, as that game closed out last night. But with that, Brady exits the NFL postseason and the Cowboys will go on to face the 49ers in the divisional round next Sunday. It was the epilogue to a wildly entertaining opening playoff weekend, which included Jacksonville pulling off the third largest comeback in NFL playoff history, letting my Oilers off the hook, Daniel Jones looking like a top five quarterback, and Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills narrowly holding off the Miami Dolphins, who are playing with their third string quarterback. But, Bomani, we'll get to some of that later. But in the aftermath of Monday night's game, do you think that was it for Tom Brady? And should it be? I have no idea the answer to either one of those questions. Because <laughs> will it be the end? That's all on him, and he crazy. Uh, should it be the end? It should be, but he crazy. Like, I just, <laughs> what I can't figure out about this. So let's take Bill Russell, right? Bill Russell has 11 championship rings. If Bill Russell had 10 championship rings, we don't view Bill Russell any differently than we <laughs> view him now. If he's got nine, we don't view him any differently than we view him right now. So what are we talking about here? Like, like what, what, what is left for him? And I guess that's a question that only he can answer. I just don't know why people keep thinking that he's just going to stay good forever. Right. And he stretched this out as far as one possibly could. But he looked old last night and he looked old at the end of that 2019 season, wrapping it up with New England. Um, and so I guess maybe think people think, OK, that happens. You fix this, you fix that and everything else will be OK. But he going to go out sad if he keeps going. And none of these cats seem to be able to stop before they go out sad. Wouldn't he? Wouldn't that sad already though? He looked old this year, right? Well, like he looked oldish this year, but also they got it back together. Like he seemed to have that same issue as Aaron Rodgers, where you ain't spent enough time around, and that hey, I've been doing this forever. What I need training camp for, what I need OTAs for, and what you needed it for was what it took you half a season to seemingly get together. You know what I mean? Like it seemed to be that kind of thing. But um, at the end, he looked better, but. He looked so bad on Monday night. He looked terrible on Monday <laughs> night. And so what you don't want is a bunch of those. Like, you can go out with that one. Like, Dan Marino went out sad when they lost that game, like, 61-7 to or oh, something to like that. To Jacksonville. Yep, uh -huh. But we, mm -hmm. don't, we don't think of his career as being defined by how sad he went out. But if he had a whole season of those, we'd be talking about something different. Well, the thing that was kind of – extremely unsurprising is that Tampa Bay was bad all year. I mean, they shouldn't have made the playoffs except for historically awful division, and they ended up looking bad in the playoffs. The thing that's confusing, it's not just Brady. It's the same, a lot of the same guys that won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. It's like same jerseys, same people. They look the same, and yet the whole team just seemed extremely dysfunctional this year. And in this game, it wasn't just that Brady, like, was throwing the ball into the dirt a lot. It seemed like he and Mike Evans just, like, didn't really understand each other in a way. 
that you, you think after a couple of years they would be on the same page. Yeah, but a couple of things. One, a couple of years is a long time in football. Like, I remember after they won that Super Bowl, the big selling point the next year was, and they're bringing back all their starters. Like, this is college. You know what I mean? Like, this, yeah. isn't, this isn't that. Some of those dudes aren't... Like, co- 18 Letterman returning. Yeah, like, in, like <laughs> in college, you could reasonably presume that those guys would be better by coming back. The NFL doesn't work that way. These dudes aren't young by and large, right? So, yeah, it is a lot of the same names as they had before. But even a dude like Mike Evans, who's still very good, you got to remember, you know who came in the NFL the same year as Mike Evans? Johnny Manziel. You know who else oh, came wow. in the NFL the same year as Mike Evans? Aaron Donald, who's about to retire, right? Like Jadavion Clowney, Khalil Mack, like those. So it's not that these guys can't be good. That's why I threw like um, Mack's name in the end. But it's a long time. And so, yeah, there they are a lot of the guys they had a couple of years ago. They probably needed to get some new ones. Man, you know, it's to your point, I cannot believe that Leonard Fournette is still their starting running back, right? Like, I mean, so I've been following Leonard Fournette since he was a freshman. Well, can you believe Ezekiel Elliott is the Cowboys starting? <laughs> I mean, that's my point. <laughs> I, can't. I mean, like that. I mean, they are in their second life uh, as as NFL players. Like this, you know, normally your career lasts what three years or whatever, and they're in their second set of these. And I mean, it, that's the reason Brady left New England because eventually they were not surrounding him with the sort of skill, position, talent. And I guess the thought was that well, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. Uh, Kate Otten, the, the, the tight end they got is pretty young and pretty good. But I just, I'm looking at that team and I'm like the offensive line was old and beat up and they still didn't have a lot of talent. I'm like, I, you hear Tom Brady say that at the end, this is a great organization or whatever, but there's surely there's no way, even if, if he comes up, because like you said, he's crazy. If he comes back, surely he does not sign up for another year of playing with that kind of supporting pass. They got to do it like basically a wholesale turnover, right? Well, to me, it's only about the offensive line. Like I think Godwin, Mike Evans, with the tight end situation you're talking about, and even with Fournette, like I think they're okay, but you can't run without an offensive line. Like when people talk about how they threw the ball so many times, Byron Leftwich isn't a fool. He knows his quarterback is a zillion years old. But if you ain't got, if you can't get no push, you can't run the ball. Like uh, Aaron Schatz at Football Outsiders makes the point in his football almanac that rushing yards are more reflective of an offensive line than anything else. Sacks are a reflection of quarterbacks. Right. Well, I mean, th- that's the thing, though. I mean, Brady took as few sacks as anybody in the league this year, but it's a bad sign for him because he's just trying not to get hit. And I noticed Correct. that. I noticed that last night. I was just like, man, the first time, it was really one of the first times I saw him get beat up. And you could see how frustrated he was getting, he was by getting touched. And that's just not something that he's used to, um, because he gets rid of the ball so fast, which means you, your receivers can't get into their routes. You can only throw the ball so far down the field. Um, I don't know. I just, I guess, you know, I mean, that's what, but isn't that what an old man would do? That's, that's also oh. kind of smart preservation because like you get 45 and if I fall down, you know, I would get hurt right now. You know what I mean? Doug, that's the thing. <laughs> He's an old man. Why does an old man want to continue doing this? Like George Bland, I want to say played till he was like 47, but he was kicking. <laughs> but why, would, but what else is he going to do? Dude, and that's, I guess, the answer to the question for him. Like, I thought he was going to be out here selling this TB12. He got this zillion-dollar contract with Fox. He got all of this stuff. But, I mean, he put his family on the roulette wheel to go 8-9, and nine, right? <laughs> and maybe he's like, I got to come back and get to a Super Bowl to justify a lot of the decisions that I done made out year. What other quarterbacks should we talk about? Um, Joel, you mentioned Daniel Jones. Oh. In your intro, is that the is that the place to Danny go? Danny Vick, man, You're running running around. They're all out fascinating. There. Every so, quarterback that's left is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, so I haven't watched a lot of Giants football. I must admit, I know Bo. You're in New York. Uh, so has Daniel Jones ever looked like that before? No, I, no, okay. no, 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 no. And look, there was that play a couple of years ago where he ran 80 yards down the field and then fell down <laughs> yeah, like right, the three no, yard no. line. That was kind of the Daniel Jones experience. I've gotten a lot of hell about not acknowledging the improvement of Daniel Jones this year. And I've popped in and watched a decent bit of Giants football this year. And I just didn't feel like I was hating on a dude that was so, you know, that I didn't feel like, like when Josh Allen, when it came around, I came around, right? Right. I didn't think that's what was happening here with Daniel Jones. But no, he never looked like that. Now, granted, you don't get to play the Vikings secondary all the time. But he definitely has thrown his way into at least another year of being the Giants quarterback. What I find so fascinating about him, and this also applies to Josh Allen, how did nobody know you were fast? 
How did you get all the way through this in life and racism made it such that nobody considered <laughs> that you were fast? Like Josh Allen, those first couple of years, you could tell he had never been like the focal point of a running play maybe since he was in seventh grade. Like he didn't know how to do any of that stuff. And I just don't understand how. Nobody ever even said he was sneaky fast. Joel, what about Brock Purdy? This is a guy who's the biggest highlight of his career going into the pros was throwing the ball 15 yards backwards <laughs> to some TCU dude. I mean, so Bomani and I disagree on this, I think, a little bit because, and look, I'm, I'm willing to change when the facts change. And now Brock Purdy looks better than I ever thought he could be. But I watched Brock Purdy play his senior year and in his bowl game, and I didn't think it was possible that that guy could be any worse. Like, I, I've, I'm trying to think, who's the guy that... um this guy that played at San Diego State, and I can his name escapes me right now. But I was like, when Brock Purdy dropped back to pass, I was like, oh, that's the best play for TCU that we can ever hope for. Brock Purdy <laughs> dropping back because he was just that bad. Um, and I, I mean, obviously, no, nobody saw this happening because he wouldn't have been Mister Irrelevant. But I, I, Joel, let me help you out. Ryan Lindley. Ryan You're Lindley. obsessed with how bad Ryan, Ryan Lindley, Lindley is. is the worst quarter. I mean, I hate you know, no offense to him, but he's the worst quarterback I ever seen in my life. Uh, <laughs> no, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> Wait, we got Tim Tebow and the Peter Man. Man, you know, man, bro, I look, bro, <laughs> look, Ryan Lindley threw five interceptions against TCU in a game. I, oh, you mean all on a college level? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, but I'm, Peter I mean, but he also made the NFL. Like, this is right. this is what's very interesting. All the people that you think are the worst are guys that actually at least have cups of coffee in the NFL. So uh, here's what I'm saying with Purdy. He was two-time first team all Big 12. He was second team all Big 12 as a sophomore. I didn't think he was great, but I thought he was a good college quarterback. What I think he is that matters a lot, though, is really confident. And so if you throw in the dudes that are butt naked open, because it ain't like he's out here like hitting dudes right out of their break in a, with a place where only his guy can get out. No, nah, man, these dudes are butt naked open, and he thinks he's good. So if you think you're good and you're throwing to open receivers, you can get something done. Right. Well, wait a minute. So obviously the 49ers, they still have got, you know, they, they're hosting a playoff game next week. And then at the offseason, they're going to have to make a decision. What are they going to do? I don't know what they're going to do. But to me, if I traded three first round picks to get Trey Lance, this decision has already been made. Damn. Trey Lance, Trey Lance has every opportunity in the world to become our quarterback. That's the way that I look at this. What Brock Purdy going to do? Be mad? Right? Like, I, like, I don't. I don't, I feel like if Brock Purdy can do this, then Trey Lance can do this. Because the question is, which one of them do you think is better? Which one of them do you think is more talented? Now, I think that what people are doing is they're riding A, the hot hand theory, and B, if they win a Super Bowl, can you bench a quarterback who just won the Super Bowl? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. I've seen it done before. The difference is Trent Dilford did it while riding one of the greatest defenses of all time, and we believe that Brock Purdy is an actual value add. But if you ever thought Trey Lance was worth making that trade for, then Trey Lance gets every opportunity to win that job. The tricky part is Trey Lance is black. And they are always ready to go to the white dude behind him on the depth chart. If that dude has a Super Bowl ring, if I'm Trey Lance, I don't even want to be here no more. Oh, you wouldn't want, yeah. Like, who who would possibly want to move into that starting position? Because I'll, if if it falls apart next year or whatever, he gets hurt or whatever. Like, it's it's it, it will never truly be his position under these circumstances. The comp for this is Cardell Jones. If they were to win a championship, it's Cardell Jones winning the championship with Ohio State after JT Barrett got hurt and they're coming back the next year like damn what do we do right which way do we go and the answer was always Barrett they didn't immediately lean, immediately lean in on it but the difference was Barrett had already put in a monster year right. nobody has seen it yet from Trey Lance but I just can't I just can't believe that a Jimmy Garoppolo can do it that Trey Lance can't <laughs> I, I just I just can't to extend the analogy Ohio State also had a guy Joe Burrow who had to transfer out to get an opportunity to Get some playing time. Yes. He turned out to be pretty Yo, good. Yo, it's so wild, like rest in peace, but to look back on it and be like, wow, Joe Burrow couldn't beat out Dwayne Haskins. And then I went back on Rivals one day and looked at the high school Dwayne Haskins and was like, oh, yeah, 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 I see. I see. I see. There was no question. That boy was going to start wherever he played. Oh, he was cold. I mean, I, I, and look, we saw Joe Burrow play. I mean, Josh, you watched Joe Burrow play. Um, and this, I'm trying a little to, bit. This is sort of this is sort of like the Max Duggan corollary, right? That nobody expected that last season for Joe Burrow. It kind of came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden, he was like a fully made 
You know what I mean? Like a, a fully yeah. made prospect. I saw Joe Burrow, the first game I saw them play that year, and I forget what happened, but he dropped back and he had a bunch of time to throw, but he bought the time with the pocket movement and everything else. And I was just like, and I remember I said it immediately. They beat Alabama. He's winning the Heisman Trophy, and he's going to be the number one pick. And that Any is chance exactly that that game was happened. against Texas? Probably. It probably was against Texas that year, right? No, no, no. That was a night game they played against somebody. I just looked up, and I was just like, oh, yeah, that guy is <laughs> that guy's going to be the number one pick. I didn't know how good he was, but that guy was going to be the number one pick. Tough to know how good anybody is if they have success against Texas, but, you know, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what say, Josh? The thing that I was going to say... Joel, is that the, it, it's hard for us to believe, even though it's happened before, that quarterbacks can kind of come out of nowhere, have insanely great stretches, even years, and not be great, like Nick Foles being the number one example. So Purdy could, like Romani said, take them to the Super Bowl, throw 18 touchdowns and no interceptions, and maybe not have a great NFL career. The thing that I'm wondering about is, is Kyle Shanahan that much better than even Sean McVay, kind of the guys who are considered as peers, as like the young hotshot offensive gurus? Because it's pretty valuable in the NFL to be able to take a dude who's picked in the seventh round on not just a rookie contract, but on a seventh round contract and turn him into a potentially Super Bowl winning quarterback. Well, what's interesting is... Um, the analytics guys will tell you his running game is a little bit overrated. Huh. Like they'll pull out some numbers to say that like them as they like, he as run game guru, the reputation may be a bit overstated, right? Like I'm not I, I I'm not qualified enough in those spaces to be the one to like be the arbiter of whether or not that's true. But I've had people bring I've seen people bring this up before. The thing with quarterbacks is I don't think we're giving enough credit to Purdy. In this, And the reason I say it is C.J. Beathard, Nick Mullins, we've seen like we've seen Kyle Shanahan try to do this with guys off the street. We've seen him try to do it with Brian Hoyer. Um, We've seen him try to do it with Kirk Cousins. And when he tried to do it with Kirk Cousins in Washington, it actually (laughs) didn't go well. That's why it's so weird that he has this fixation and fascination with him, because it's not like they had success together. I think this has more to do with Purdy than people want to give it credit for. Like even with all his quarterback magic, he had to go an entire second half without letting Jimmy Garoppolo throw the ball. It's not that you can just drop any quarterback into this offense and then suddenly it works. Hell, Trey Lance, we're not sure about. Like, that's the thing. If we really think that you can just drop anybody in there, then you drop Trey Lance in there and there's no discussion to be had. A lot of this has to do with Purdy. And all these guys, like with McVay, when he had to go down from Jerry Goff, it didn't get better. You know, like talent... Talent is a thing. The talent part does matter with Shanahan. Well, the question is going to be with this, will Shanahan, the play caller, get himself in trouble? Because that's where he tends to come off the rails a bit, is getting a little weird with the things that he decides to do and decides to call. We've been talking about quarterbacks that did play last weekend. We didn't talk about one who did not play, Lamar Jackson, who released a statement via Twitter saying that his knee wasn't right and wasn't going to be able to play. And predictably, the Ravens went out and lost their playoff game, but they looked okay. Like Huntley, you know, looked all right. But what do you think is going to happen with Lamar for going forward here? I've heard you all talk about this a little bit about like, this is why you have an agent, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> because it doesn't want, it doesn't get quite as personal in these discussions with the team. But like, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, he's going to be playing for the Baltimore Ravens next year. Um, I don't know what exactly the dollar amount is going to be, but he's going to be playing for the Baltimore Ravens. Now, the Ravens are going to have to ante up a little bit more than they want to. If they offered him 133 and Russell Wilson's gotten 165, they're going to have to ante up and get toward that level. I agree with the Ravens that we shouldn't have to give you $205 million guaranteed just because the Browns are idiots. Like that, <laughs> that, 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 that can't dictate the way that we make decisions over here. But I think... What I'm so confused about is Lamar's teammates are making it very clear that that dude is hurt, right? They're like, we see him around here. He is hurt. That would then mean that the Ravens can very clearly tell that he is hurt. So why has this gotten to this place right now, seemingly over this injury, if he's hurt? Because if I'm the Ravens, I don't want to bring him back on a bad wheel, right? Like, A, you're not going to win with him on a bad wheel. Like guys like that, it don't work that way. Okay, so you don't want to bring him back on a bad wheel. He's the best quarterback option you're going to have, which means you got a long-term investment in his body. I don't understand how this got to the place that it is. 
All right, and in the next segment, we try to figure out what the hell is going on with the explosion and crazy stat lines of the NBA. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval, daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. On Monday, Steph Curry scored 41 points against the Wizards. LeBron James put up 48 against the Rockets. Sorry, Joel. And Jason Tatum had 51 against the Hornets. The thing is, none of those performances were all that extraordinary. There have been 103 40-point games in the NBA this season, already the eighth most in league history, and there are a huge number of games left to play. There have also been 16 50-plus point games, including double nickels from Giannis and Anthony Davis, a 58-pointer from Devin Booker, 59 from Joel Embiid, 60 from Luka Doncic, and 71 from Donovan Mitchell. Bamani, the reflexive explanation for all this is that teams and individual players are shooting more threes, but in four of the six games I just mentioned, AD, Giannis, Embiid, and Luka combined for just five total threes between them in those four games. So what do you think is going on here and how should we process all these big numbers that we're seeing? Well, I think part of it is definitely officiating, right? Like the NBA has wished to have a higher scoring game. I haven't seen any evidence to indicate that higher scoring makes people watch the game more. But, you know, it stands to reason. OK, you go ahead and do that. So I think you're, you're always when you're going to see scoring spikes like this, you're going to have that. I wonder how much of it also is just the fluid nature of who plays from night to night. Like who is on who's in the box score for any given game in the NBA could be anybody. Like I'm not sure who was out there when Donovan Mitchell was putting up all those points. But what's worth noting is they needed every single one of those points. Like if I'm not mistaken, that game was an overtime game. Right. Um, so yeah, part of it is going to be tied to the three point shooting. Like that's going to happen if some guys are going to go on fire and you got guys shooting 15, 16 threes in a night, you know, because why not, right? That's going to be part of it. But I also think that it has to be something more structural that's going on. Because it's not like, as much as we say these guys have gotten so much better at scoring, in theory, they should have gotten so much better at playing defense. Well, hold on. Let me ask you. So so you you, you mentioned that there's no evidence that this makes, you know, these sport, the scoring explosions make the game more likely to be watched. Do you think this is entertaining? Because I know you've talked a little bit no. about, okay. No. I think... The NBA made a stylistic change to the basketball that was necessary when they started allowing the zone principles and started outlawing contact because it had become sludge, right? Like nobody wanted to watch playoff games, like NBA finals games with the team scoring in the 50s. Nobody wanted to see that. They needed to make it a more free-flowing and a more open game. But a game that focuses so much on skill and execution, I don't think is nearly as interesting as one where toughness is much more of a variable that comes up. Like when we talk about the, the uh, Michael Jordan scores 69 in the game. We had other games where Michael Jordan scores 60. The most memorable Michael Jordan performance is scoring 37 with the flu. That is what reaches people. That's what hit folks. So why you got a league that's set up with, where people are so iterant and going from team to team and everything else and so little feels familiar watching guys put up crazy numbers. No, this is a personality game. Like, I think the thing that makes the NFL so compelling to people is the urgency of it. And this does not speak to urgency. That being said, by the time you get to the playoffs, you're going to see them point totals go way down. We keep seeing this happen year after year, and them numbers going to look a lot more familiar. Well, couldn't you argue that the NBA um, is having it both ways, that in the regular season where it's harder to get people to pay attention, you have these big scoring numbers that get people to tune in like if you hear that donovan mitchell's got 50 or 60 you're going to want want to watch that game when you wouldn't have any interest otherwise and then in the playoffs you do get the 
urgency. And the playoffs are two months long. So yeah, that's a long stretch of time. But the question is, are people tuning in to watch Donovan Mitchell score 71 points? And that's what I can't like the NBA's relevance in the regular season feels more muted than ever. And there's no real way to like quantify or qualify that. I, like, I totally get that. That's a, you know, a statement that's largely anecdotal, but it doesn't feel like, I, and I blame the 2016 Warriors. Once the 2016 Warriors went 73 and nine and didn't win a championship and then added Kevin Durant and people basically said the regular season doesn't matter. I don't think the game is really recovered from that. Like when you think about this, man, everybody talked this about Jokic and the MVP and is he affecting winning? They got the best record in the West. Mm. You know, like there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's going on. And maybe after the NFL gets out of here, you have time to pay attention and recognize what's happening. But I felt like six, seven years ago, there was room to pay attention to what the Warriors were doing, even at this time of year while football was going on. Well, I so it's interesting because you mentioned, uh, Bamani, that you know, it would stand to reason that the players would be better at defense. And th- in this uh, athletic roundtable on the scoring explosion, they mentioned something that was fairly interesting and I had not thought about in quite a while. The absence or the decline of the defensive specialist in the NBA. I'm just talking like Ben Wallace. Like, could you put Ben Wallace on the NBA floor today and expect your team to thrive? Because that, I don't, I mean, he's such a great defensive player. He's made it to the Hall of Fame. But yeah, I just feel like players like that don't can't get burned anymore because they'll get exposed. Nah, you could put him on the floor. I mean, Draymond Green's still out here playing basketball. Badly. Um, ben Simmons. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but that's 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 the counterexample. Like, how much you could play him does become a question. Like, this sounds like a hot take, but the NBA was more fun when not everybody could play basketball. Like, they basically created a game you want more that Michael requires... <laughs> you want Michael yes, Cage, man? <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Think about this. Nobody's in the league just to rebound, right? There is no, like, who's the hard hat guy? Michael Ruffin. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Those things matter. Those things add to the fabric of what the game is. But basically, everybody has to be able to shoot. And you eliminate a lot of the fun. Like, you mentioned Ben Wallace. Could Charles Oakley Oof. play now? Well, he had the little elbow jump, but yeah, you're right. I mean, like having, a <laughs> but but he jump. but he couldn't take it out to three point <laughs> right, range, right? Like those dudes that can't really, that aren't particularly skilled offensively, have to at the very least be capable three point shooters. So if you're seven feet tall, yeah, you could be that defensive stopper sort of guy. The question, and that's why Ben Wallace could probably still play because he could play like a seven footer and he could switch out on the perimeter. And I guess you leave him in the dunker spot, right? Like Rudy Gobert can play, so maybe Ben Wallace can play, but. The game was better when there were just some dudes out here being rough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bamani, you also mentioned you don't know who was playing uh, against Donovan Mitchell in that 71-point game. The other thing is you don't know when Donovan Mitchell is playing. Yes. Or you don't know when mm-hmm. um, you know a lot of these guys are playing. So part of the reason I think we're seeing these individual high-scoring games is because the guys who are capable of doing it are better rested because they don't play every game. Yes. And also, like, what what do I have here? 56 players are averaging 20 points per game if you include guys like Zion and like Steph who haven't played enough games to officially qualify for the scoring title. They're like two, an average of two guys per team averaging 20 per game. And so that's the other thing I wanted to ask. I think the answer is that as fans, we just have no ability to adjust for era. But like, how should we process the fact that scoring 20 points per game doesn't really mean what it used to like two years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. I think I need to go through that list and see how many of those guys are dudes who only get buckets. Cause like one thing I don't like is dudes who only get buckets, but guys that make basketball more fun is the occasional dude who only gets buckets. Like that's my only purpose that I serve here. I don't really play defense. I don't move without the ball. I just come out here and I get buckets. Like who that number 58 guy is that scoring. I, mean, I think 20 Terry points. Rozier is on the list. Jordan Clarkson is on the yeah. list. I mean, well, the other part is this is the, the context that does matter is that we do have more good basketball players in the NBA than we have ever had. The talent level in the league, wall to wall, is spectacular. Like, that's the biggest difference between now and 30 years. Like I said, everybody in the NBA now can play basketball. That wasn't always the case. So let's, uh, I want to run this clip because I think Kobe may have been onto something in a manner of speaking, but uh, I'm going to run this theory by you guys. He was, he was misunderstood, man. People, I asked him one time, Matt, like, I asked him, I said, man, why are you such an asshole? I asked him that. And he said, you really want to know? Mm-hmm. You know how he was. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, he said, Phil, man, 
some of my teammates don't understand the work. He says, so I see dudes walk into practice 10 minutes before practice and they leave right after. Why the fuck am I gonna pass them the basketball? I don't respect their work ethic. I'm in here busting my ass every day trying to perfect my craft and these dudes, these dudes don't wanna work on their game. I don't trust them. So I'm not gonna pass them the basketball. I'm gonna ride them hard every day. Made perfect sense when he really broke it down as to why he is the way he is with certain dudes. I was just like, man, I respect that. Okay, so I think without you know giving it the gloss of I'm the hardest working guy, the NBA bullshit, I think Kobe had made reference to this in another way once before. It's like, why would I pass the ball to like Samaki Walker when I could be shooting? And I think, don't you think that like NBA superstars and players have realized it's better actually if I have the ball in my hands all the fucking time because that's, I mean, why would you why would you pass the ball if you're Kobe or Steph or Brian? Well, A, counterpoint LeBron James. B, the era where Kobe was most like that, Kobe was his least successful. Like the thing about LeBron is LeBron did play with Smush Parkers of the world and he dragged him to the NBA finals. Now you could argue that they wouldn't be able to drag him to the finals in the West. Yeah, that may be the case. But it is very interesting that in after Kobe's passing that we have tried to make him a template of leadership when there <laughs> let's stop and think about all that stuff because we sure didn't do it in real time um I think that a lot of teams are deciding like I think Mike D'Antoni James Harden being a great example that the best thing is to put that dude at the top of the key and let him cook um counterpoint Jokic and what's going on with the Nuggets where yeah he's got the ball in his hands a bunch but it's also about getting these guys in position to take these shots because yeah Kobe's like yeah these guys don't work as hard as me da 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 but just about everybody in the NBA can make an open three-pointer and the the rules are incentivized now for you to work the ball around to basically get that open three-pointer for that guy and get it there but if you cooking then you're going to get the chance to cook especially a dude like Donovan Mitchell who can do more than just get buckets but that's what he's here for I am here to get buckets. Devin Booker, I am here to get buckets. This is what I do. That Kobe anecdote is the best example of ex post facto justification I've ever heard in my life. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to pass the ball. Now, why don't I want to pass? Oh, because they don't work as hard as me. That's it. That's, hey, that's no, why no, I don't no, want to pass I know the ball. that one, man. It'd be hard to trust them people that don't work hard, but Kobe, we're not asking you, like, <laughs> the dude standing eight feet away from the basket by himself. He's in the NBA. <laughs> No, it was, uh, it was uh, Michael Ruffin. That's why I wouldn't pass <laughs> the ball. Those guys couldn't shoot back then. One theory that I've seen that's interesting that I hadn't thought of is that it's actually not the just constant rain of three-pointers that's necessarily making offenses score so many more points. It's the fact that defenses are honoring it too much, mm-hmm. that they're just like going out and playing all the... Like, obviously, you want to defend Steph Curry out to 30 feet, but maybe you don't need to defend like every body who's standing outside the three-point line as aggressively because then what happens is that you just are leaving guys wide open for um, layups and easy two-pointers yeah and we're also if i'm not mistaken this is like the fastest era of basketball that we've had like i know a couple years ago when looking at the pace statistics they were way up like getting a lot more shots and a lot more possessions which of course is then going to throw the numbers um sky high but it's interesting though We'll see these sporadic outbursts, but we're not getting somebody scoring like 40 a game. You know, we, we, we haven't gotten, we're not to that point. Or somebody even putting up like the 37, I think Harden may have, but like putting up that 37, 38 that Jordan put up in 87. Well, isn't it tough to be on a team with a guy shooting that much? Even with the, the, the pace, the usage rates up, all that sort of stuff, like you still are in a locker room and guys yeah. want to shoot, right? Nobody started playing basketball because they didn't want to shoot. Right. Nobody like I was thinking about this with sports, general, but football and basketball as the American sports in particular, the power of the ball, like the idea of the ball. There are so many other things for you to do. There's so many other ways to contribute in playing a sport. But the ball, the ball is the center of everything. It's why them fat dudes in football be so damn happy (laughs) when they get to score a touchdown because they finally get to touch the ball, right? Um, When D.I. Waiters, I remember he got traded to the uh, Thunder, and his big thing was like, yo, they give me the ball. Like, they want me to have the ball. Like, it's the center of energy of all things that are there. Which is to say, don't nobody feel like playing with Luka or these other cats. Like, there's some dudes that, like, 
Some dudes are self-aware enough to realize, like, yo, this is my ticket. I got on. I can make this happen. I'm so lucky that I get to ride out here with Luca while Luca's out here doing this. The NBA is not full of self-aware guys. It's a bunch of dudes that believe, like, they could be scoring 30 points a game if they got to take that many shots. Well, Trey Young is the example of that, like, where it's fun when he's making the shots, and this year he's making 30-something low 30s yes. and threes. That guy's not fun to play any, play with anymore. Curious for you guys, just like snap take on this, is that analytics has brought more passing and less running to football. Fans seem to like that. Analytics has brought more scoring, more three-point shooting to basketball. And then it's questionable whether fans like that more. Analytics has brought more walks, strikeouts, and home runs to baseball. Fans seem to hate that, or maybe not. Maybe that's just too simplistic. What do you think of those uh, takes, Bomani? It's not making anything more fun. It might make it more efficient, but it's not really making it more fun. And I am not sure that football fans like passing that much more. There's no evidence of this. Like, it's a theory that we started with. And like, when it was kind of newfangled, we went with that and we rolled with it. But again, whose offense is it that we spend most of our time talking about? Kyle Shanahan. The Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, and those are running offenses. Who is the the most entertaining quarterbacks to watch are the ones that can run, right? Um, We've moved into this passing game and it centers things around quarterbacks. But I was just watching a video of Barry Sanders. I got one of those 90-second cut-ups of Barry Sanders the other day. You're not going to tell me that anything is more fun than watching that, right? Like when you and think people of, were really excited to see Saquon have a really good game. Oh, right. Or, or I think about like the defining game of Emma Smith's career, the last game of the 1993 season where he ran for like 200. It wasn't 200, but it was in the high 100s with a separated shoulder, his arm dangling. He can't pick it up, and he's just running through these massive holes. The NF, What I feel like the NFL did was – they took a movie that was a drama and they turned it into like an Avenger movie. You know what I mean? Like they 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 went for something that didn't hit your heart nearly as much as it kind of like woohoo excited you. But with basketball, it's got to be more of a drama than that. Like they don't have the budget to make the explosive bang bang movie that's really going to hold on. People need personalities in basketball to latch on to. And so the analytics move of all these other things and it's more efficient for winning. Yeah, that's cool, but when I think about Dominique Wilkins, I don't care whether he won. I just want to watch. The only team I care about winning is the one I root for. Other time, I'm just I'm just here for a party. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad somebody you said that because yeah, the idea that passing is more fun. Well, I mean, do people like watching Mississippi State play football under Mike Leach? I mean, I didn't think it was that fun. Tom Brady passed 66 Too soon, times. Joel. Too soon. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But you know what I mean. Like, I mean, is it really that fun? Tom Brady threw 66 times last night. I mean, I was I enjoyed watching him lose. Did you? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you got know, a macabre view of, of football, but yeah, I just the base of football. Like, if you just go back to when you were a fan and like YouTube was a thing, I was looking at like running back highlight videos. Nobody looks at the quarterback highlight videos unless they're making people miss with a runner, right? So, right. What's fun about watching Tom Brady? You can appreciate it. But what's fun about why even Peyton Manning was more fun because at least he was doing the bird and all that shit at the line. But, you know, before he got it cracking. But like, what's fun about watching that? Dan Marino, it was fun because we had just never seen nobody throw the ball like that before. It was just like, like you could hear it on TV, just just running through the air. But Barry Sanders, Earl Campbell, you know what I'm saying? Like LaDainian Tomlinson, even when we get into that space, a great running back is so much more fun to watch than any of this other stuff. You can listen to Bamani Jones on the Right Time podcast. And from now until the end of time, he'll be talking about 65 to 7. So, you know, you can just Hate have that to really sink into. Yeah. Also, I'm going to talk about theory. 66 to 3, by the way. I'm going to bring that up a little bit more. I feel like that <laughs> you, needs you, to you, get back you, into it. You, you can, you can, you can yeah. feel you, free you to can do pretend that. that that doesn't hurt. But I mean, <laughs> you can pretend that hurt, but I know better. I know. You keep wanting it to hurt, but I know what hurts. Watching your team lose sixty five to seven I'm in fine. front of your seed. I'm fine. In front of your seed. <laughs> like, like, do you, like, like, like that boy. That boy <laughs> looked up and saw TCU lose sixty five to seven, and he don't know the we words had, yet. But he was like, "Wow, we had fourteen I great weeks. We had fourteen great weeks. I don't. You're not going. Yeah, you're not yeah, gonna, yeah. You're not gonna all, ruin all, that for all, me. All, all, all fourteen great weeks that you didn't enjoy because you were too busy thinking that they was gonna lose one day to Sun, with Sunny Dykes, and then in the end, <laughs> what happened? Your friendly reminder that damn. In at your core, y'all are a bunch of losers. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? We st- and we still own Texas. Good for you. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I also need to mention Game Theory with Bomani Jones premiering on HBO this week on Friday. Bomani, good luck with the show. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Friday, uh, Fridays, 11 Eastern, immediately following real time with Bill Maher. It seems like the kind of program y'all's listeners get into. <laughs> <laughs> He's misses uh, about the same amount as uh, Brett Maher. <laughs> I caught that. Up next, our interview with the Black Widow, Jeanette Lee. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the more than 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customer surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval, daily cash is available via an Apple Cash Card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash Card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. Jeanette Lee was, and probably still is, the most famous pool player in the world. She became a star in the early 90s, thanks to her mastery of the felt and her all-time classic nickname. Here's a clip from the new 30 for 30 documentary, Jeanette Lee Versus, which is available to watch anytime on ESPN+. The room owner, Gabe Figueroa, one night came to lock up. He was just standing there looking at me and said, you need a nickname because you're going to be a champion. I've got the nickname, the Black Widow. And I'm going, how do I remind you of a Black Widow? I'm super nice. And he said, remember that first day I saw you? You're smiling to your friends, you're grabbing your cue, chalking it up, doing whatever, and then boom, everything changed. In Black, wants to kill. That's a great story, and there are a lot more just like it in the documentary, which delves into Lee's role as a Korean-American sports icon, her lifelong battle with chronic pain, and most recently, her diagnosis with ovarian cancer. Joining us now is Jeanette Lee. Thanks so much for being here, Jeanette. Hello, I'm glad to be here. And yeah, I got diagnosed last year with stage four ovarian cancer. So there's no stage after four, you know? And so it was really, really scary. And I think the greatest gift that I could have ever gotten through such a tough time is to find out that ESPN wants to do a 30 for 30 documentary on me and my life. So someone is kind of memorializing My life, that my children, my grandchildren, that just to know that somebody was definitely going to record it, finally, my life, it was, it was such a gift. And then when I saw it, they really did a great job of understanding me and telling my story. And of course, in one hour, it can't cover everything. I think I'm going to try to put more in my book, but it's a great documentary. Tune in. It's a really special documentary, as you said, and it chronicles your life from 
beginning to end. I wanted to start by asking about ESPN because you were an ESPN staple and you kind of helped build ESPN too. Um, How important was it that the women's professional tour was on television and how much did you think about yourself as a TV star as well as an athlete? Wow, that's a good question. I mean, when I started, it wasn't about the TV at all. It was all about excellence. It was all about getting better, becoming the best player in the world, continuing to grow. I was so hungry and I have such a competitive spirit and I fell in love with this game. And so I really didn't think about the TV until TV responded with a lot of great support, you know, and encouragement from fans and from ESPN. And then I realized, hey, I'm, I'm starting to become, you know, a staple in billiards as it relates to TV. And it's a great, it's a great honor. You just want to represent yourself well, but you want to stay very real and genuine. And that's what I've tried to do. And I've shared every part of my journey. I mean, everybody on tour, they know about my back surgeries. They know about, I mean, it's over 22 surgeries. And then to get slapped with a stage four ovarian cancer, it was so much. But every single thing you go through, as long as you survive it, just getting out of bed and putting your feet on the floor itself is sometimes the most courageous thing you can do. And it inspires everybody around you, watching you as you go through this. And you don't have to be happy and merry. You just got to get through it. And that's really powerful. And you even mentioned your anger at the diagnosis of scoliosis at the age of 12. And I know even, you know, from the documentary, you talked about being sort of adrift as a teenager. So I I, kind of want to take you back to that moment and talk about how you discovered Chelsea Billiards at the age Mm. of 18. And it was like this real pop culture moment for pool. But I want to go even back further than that. Can you tell me about like when you first picked up a pool cue? Like when did you think, hey, let me try that. That seems cool. The first time I ever touched a cue would probably be by my high school sweetheart, um, Greg Heilwell, who would who taught me how to cut class, basically. <laughs> and because I was never doing that before, I didn't even know that was an option. But he took me to a pool room and we would play pool together. And, and I really enjoyed it. But it wasn't something that I, I would normally go to um, or be able to drive to or anything like that. But when I was 18, it was just an explosion for some reason. There were pool rooms opening up everywhere. And I found Chelsea Billiards which was the biggest, coolest place I'd ever seen. Had 52 tables and snooker tables, three cushion billiard tables. They sold cappuccino, you know? And we're like, this is a pool room (laughs) serving cappuccinos. And so, yeah, I just loved, I loved that entire time of just growing, even though it was hard because I still had all these back issues during that time. And I was so obsessed with pool that I was constantly playing 20 hours, 24 hours in a row, 30. The, the most was 37 hours in a row. And I wasn't trying. It was just something that, you know, people noticed. I was always in the pool room. I couldn't let it go. How were you received as a, a woman and as a, a Korean American in the pool world? Well, I made a lot of money being a woman in a men's pool world. <laughs> because... Although I never, I never wanted to hustle. I feel like that's a bully picking on a little kid. You know, it's just not, there's nothing rewarding about it, you know, to try to trick someone by hustling them. But I would play my game. They would know exactly who I were. They'd see my game and they would still underestimate me. And Mm. so it became very nice. I was okay with everyone underestimating me. But as I grow, it's like, no, you don't have to just play the game that's dealt to you. You can create a new path, you know, and you can bring more grace and more attention to the game of billiards in whatever way you can. And so that's what I did. I did work on being a better ambassador for pool and, um, I never wanted my injuries and my problems to affect my life too much because I didn't want, 
I was too proud and I didn't want anyone thinking that I was trying to use my pain as an excuse. So did you hide it like from your, from the public um, when you were playing? Did you like consciously try to create this kind of glamorous image and not the image of the person who every time she'd been over was in excruciating pain? I would say at the beginning I did. I wasn't ashamed of it, but I was so self-conscious of what, what everybody thought. You know, and so I didn't want people think that I'm limping around to make an excuse in case I lose. I was too self-conscious. It's awful. Now I'm saying it, I'm ashamed of myself, but I was young, you know, but as I grew, I became more confident and more intentional about the empowerment that you get when you get through your trials and tribulations, you know? If you can just get through it, survive it. I mean, you don't even have to th- thrive. You just, just get through it. And right. you will be stronger at the end of it, and you will have inspired many people, and you will then have a voice. You mentioned that, and you talked about, you know, wanting to be an ambassador for the game, uh, being out front, being very self-conscious about that thing. So I'm sort of curious to know what you thought. There's this moment in the documentary where you say, I've never wanted to be famous. That's not one of my goals. But then your main nemesis, Allison Fisher, says right after that, the difference between Jeanette and me was that Jeanette wanted to be the best known player in the world. And I wanted to be known as the best player in the world. And I just was curious to know how you felt to hear that. Uh, And do you think that a lot of the people um, that followed the game felt the same way? I wasn't treated very well in my early years on the WPBA. I think that they thought that I got yeah. too much attention too fast. It took me three years to turn pro and a year and a half on the tour to become number one. And I think I made some enemies then, you know, plus everyone was stressed. I tried to be like them, you know, silk blouses, pleated slacks and, you know, dress pants. And, oh, and I was like, I felt so uncomfortable. I just felt like I was in a straight jacket, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I finally, I think I just said, you know what? I'm just going to be me. And I went back to wearing black and I grew into loving the nickname, the black widow. It gave me permission to have some swagger, you know, and to tease people and go, okay, let's go. But it, it wasn't about fame. I did work hard to get known in order to have sponsors so that I can keep playing and not have to have another job because the money in billiards is nothing like the money in football, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and it's very expensive to be on the tour. So it's really the spirit of love. You know, you love the game and you want to compete. So you keep doing it, but it's definitely not for the prize money, but I didn't want to work a second job. And so I have to pick up sponsors, which means I must be marketable, which means that, you know, you have to figure out, how you want to present yourself and you have to pay attention to the media. And I did, I went to every charity event. I went to every TV or radio interview. It didn't matter if it was 6 AM. I was there and it was all over the country. And so eventually it all kind of added up to people recognizing me on ESPN and then doing this 30 for 30 series, which I have followed and put in this Asian American woman during this time, it, mm-hmm. it, it was the greatest gift for a stage four cancer, you know, patient to, to have. My favorite quote of yours from the documentary, Jeanette, is when you said, pretty doesn't make the balls go in. <laughs> well, because I kept getting all this attention about me being pretty, which at the time, I didn't really feel <laughs> pretty, but what I look like has nothing to do with it. And then people, a couple of players, I... I heard in interviews said, well, she just has that look on the pool table because she's trying to intimidate her opponents with her whole look and glare and all this. I'm not thinking about any of that. I'm thinking about pool. You know, I'm thinking about what's on the table and getting a job done and being better than you and outsmarting you and outskilling you. You you know, you mentioned the importance of, of being an Asian American woman. And, you know, obviously there would not, there couldn't have been that many people for you to look up toward when you were making your way through billiards, right? At that, at that right, moment. No. Uh, but, and even before then, you talked about your childhood in Brooklyn, where it seemed like 
you were maybe the only Korean kid in class and maybe the only Asian. You said, I think the quote was all black neighborhood against one Korean, every day being young and being hated and not understanding. How did that experience sort of help your perception of yourself and the way that other people saw you as you, you know, advanced and became a, a, a national sensation? I will say that when you grow up and go to school and you start walking to school by yourself and it was mm-hmm. three and a half blocks, Actually, I think it was four and a half blocks to get to my, to my school there. And it was every day, ching chong, ching 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 chong, telly wong, you know, it was, it was constant. And then eventually, like, I became a little physical. <laughs> Got mad at, at times. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, what? <laughs> okay. Wait a minute. What do you mean physical? Can you what, is, what, what happened? Can you can you tell us about that? Eventually, I fought back. You get <laughs> sick of it, and and I I'm thinking every time I was around, it was like I was not good enough. I was twelve, eleven, I think, and my sister was beautiful. I thought she was the most pretty woman in the whole world. She couldn't stand me because I was her bratty little sister, but I really looked up to her and she was valedictorian of our school. I was also living up to, you know, every teacher I went to, they said, oh, you're Doris's little sister. And I was always in her shadow kind of, but I didn't think a lot of myself. And by the time I was, had scoliosis, now I have this huge scar down my back, you know? Yeah, I was broken. And when I found pool, it was the first time I stopped caring what people thought. I, was just, I just became so obsessed with the game and becoming better. And for me right now is being the ambassador for the V Foundation who focuses on cancer research. And I've seen firsthand the good works that they do and, and how much they really care. I'm very proud to be part of their team. But ESPN, memorializing my life, it is the greatest gift to someone that's dealing with cancer. The documentary is Jeanette Lee versus, um, you can watch it on ESPN anytime on ESPN Plus. Jeanette Lee, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful to you guys and I have a lot of fun doing it and I hope everyone tunes in. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. And now it is time for Afterball, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. We are going to honor Michael Ruffin, who sort of became, in our basketball segment, Joel, your stand-in for just a certain type of man who <laughs> made his living playing professional basketball in days of yore. Um, I'm looking at his Wikipedia page. I just can't get enough of the sentence. Ruffin's best statistical season came with the 2001 Bulls, where he tallied career best averages in rebounding, 5.8, and scoring, (laughs) 2.6. That's your man. Man, I saw him play in in college when TCU and Tulsa were in the same league. He's he's pretty tough, uh, pretty tough opponent. I've seen to remember him having some pretty big games. He had like a 30-20 game against TCU when he was in college, I think. All right, here's the point per game by points per game by year. 2.2. Then we've got the season where the point total is in bold because it's a career high. 2.6. Oh. 1, 1. 1.1, 1. 2.2, 1.4, 1. 1.4, 1. 1.6, 2.0, 0.5. Yeah. 0.5. Man, can you I mean he made it. How many seasons is that? Nine seasons in the NBA, never averaging more than 2.6 points a game. We are shortchanging him though, because in the 2005 playoffs with Washington, he averaged 2.6. So he kind of he 
he made it happen when the games mattered most. He upped his uh, scoring average. He also majored in chemical engineering. So shout out to him. And he's an NBA assistant coach. So putting that degree to use. All right, uh, Joel, what is your Michael Ruffin? All right. So forget all the talk about 65 to 7. Now that college football is finally mercifully over, we can and should turn our attention to men's college basketball, where surely Creighton is playing against some Big East program whose best years were in the 1980s on FS2. Speaking of programs whose best years were in the 1980s, have any of you been paying attention to what's been happening at Georgetown? The Hoyas, perhaps the most fearsome team in college hoops, have become a punchline, a doormat, an easy mark. On Monday, Georgetown lost its 28th straight regular season game against Big East opponents in a 77-73 defeat at Villanova. The Georgetown loss broke a tie with DePaul for the longest regular season losing streak in Big East Conference history. Overall, the Hoyas dropped to 5-14 and with their only wins this season coming against this murderous row. Coppin State, Green Bay, LaSalle, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and Siena. Georgetown has lost nine straight since that went over Siena on December 7th. And it's been quite a decline for the Hoyas, a stretch that Aiden Curran at Hilltop Hoops calls the lowest point in its storied program's history. The man in charge of the program today is the man who helped elevate the program to its highest point in its storied history, Patrick Aloysius Ewing. Ewing has been the head coach at Georgetown since 2017. And if you think there was ever a bright spot in his tenure to justify his continued employment, I invite you to personally identify that moment to me in email or on Twitter. His second season was his best one, when the Hoyas went 19-14 and overall and 9-9 and in Big East play and were ousted in the first round of the NIT. In Ewing's fourth year, Georgetown finished in eighth place in the league, but won the Big East tournament and clinched their only spot in the NCAA tournament in the past seven years. That's about it in terms of bright spots. Ewing's overall record as a head coach is 73-97 and overall and 26-69 and in the Big East. It's reasonable to assume that after this spring, Ewing will be fired and Georgetown will attempt to dig out of this massive hole. It wasn't supposed to be this way. When Ewing took over in 2017, hopes were high that he could restore Georgetown to its former glory. As a player, Ewing had led the Hoyas to three Big East championships, three Final Fours, and the 1984 National Championship. Do not investigate who they won to get that championship, by the way. It's not important. Remember, this is the program of Ewing, Matumbo, Alonzo Mourning, Reggie Williams and the Miracles. Allen Iverson. It's not supposed to be like this at Georgetown. And after his Hall of Fame NBA career, Ewing worked on the sidelines for four teams, the Wizards, the Rockets, the Magic, and the Bobcats. Ewing had a resume that looked a lot different from his peers who'd gone back to the alma mater, like Chris Mullen at St. John's or Clyde Drexler at Houston. He truly grinded his way into a premier coaching job. He, for lack of a better term, earned it. But now it appears the time has come to move on. Ewing obviously bears a lot of responsibility for what's happened there at Georgetown, Aiden Curran of Hilltop Hoops identifies another culprit, Ronnie Thompson, son of the legendary Georgetown coach, John Thompson. Ronnie is a former Hoyas player and assistant coach there, and he rejoined the program when Ewing was hired in 2017. Thompson isn't listed in the staff directory, but is referred to himself as the, quote, chief of staff of the men's basketball program. Curran writes, Georgetown has long kept things in the family. Now as the losses pile up and a dying program falls further into irrelevancy, it's beginning to reap what it has sown. Either way, it's sad to think about Georgetown, as improbable of a basketball blue blood as there is, a small Jesuit school in Washington, D.C., becoming yet another family-run operation that's time has passed it by. The Hoyas have 12 more chances to break this embarrassing conference losing streak. I'm sure they play Creighton about three or four more times. Who knows? And for their sake, and for the sake of college basketball, it'd be nice if they could at least get past this. But Georgetown, please, let me just give you one warning. Do not dragged Allen Iverson into this nonsense. It is a really sad decline. And also, he clearly hasn't been doing a good job, but it's always sad to see somebody like Patrick Ewing. It's good to see like players get a chance, especially centers. There's this bias against tall people coaching that I that yeah. we should we should try to fight against. But to see him be embarrassed in this way and do like such a poor job, it's like if they had, if it was just like some random dude who was screwing things up for Georgetown, it wouldn't feel as Craig Eshery. upsetting. Or whoever, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, John Thompson, who died, was it a couple of years ago now? He just like yeah, a couple years ago, still looms over that program, and you'd have to think that they need to make some kind of 
outside higher at this point. Um, but it's, it's really gotten to a pretty terrible place. Is it more embarrassing for Patrick Ewing to finish out the season or is it more embarrassing to get fired before the season ends? I mean, at this point, <laughs> it's sort of like, is it more embarrassing to, to you know, have Kirby Smart still uh, scoring touchdowns in the fourth quarter, okay. just like kneeling, just kneeling and giving the ball back to you? I mean, what, which, uh, oh, okay. which, which, right. which do you oh, prefer? Okay. There we go. Okay, there we go. There we go, Josh. Hey, what, what, LSU's 9-4 and four this year. You, don't, don't, you, <laughs> you're talking a little spicy. 10-4. Oh, the only bad. good right. play that Georgetown had this year was Brandon Murray, who left... Uh, LSU and the Will Wade debacle had a really good dunk. Brandon Murray with the dunk of the year? Question mark. I'll send it to you. You can enjoy it after okay, after awesome. we stop recording. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Joel Anderson, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zalmo Beatty and thanks for listening. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.